Okay. Uh, does anyone know what this picture is of? Anyone can tell me what that is? Okay, that's correct. That's the Statue of Liberty. Uh, I want to ask, has anyone ever visited the Statue of Liberty? Or seen it live in person? Okay, Lennox has seen it live. Good, from a boot, right? Okay. Right, it's a very uh, popular uh, picture or statue. Most people are familiar with it. Uh, does it. Can you tell me where it's located? Check the line. It's in New York City, correct, and it's actually on an island, in, island in New York City. It's called Liberty Island. It's in New York Harbor in New York City, right? Now it consists of a copper statue, statue, which was a gift from the people of France to the people of the United States. And it was dedicated back in October the 28th, 1886. All right, which makes it approximately 133 years old. And it was designed and built to symbolize American liberty and freedom. Uh, it was built after the American Civil War, which led to the abolition of slavery in America. As most of us may know, the American Civil War was a war between the Northern States and the Southern States. The Northern States wanted to abolish slavery, whilst the Southern States wanted to maintain it. Now, America prides itself as being the land of the free, where all men are free. Now, liberty and freedom are integral parts of the principles and ideas of the founding fathers on which America was built. And I have here a quote from the Declaration of Independence, which was signed by the 13 American states that declared independence from Great Britain in 1776. So I'm going to read that out now. Um, I don't know if we can make the quote bigger. Right? Um, it states, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I want us to notice the word liberty in those words. Brethren, it's the desire of all men and women to be free. No one wants to be enslaved. Now, here in Trinidad and Tobago, we celebrate freedom from slavery in the observance of Emancipation Day on August the 1st each year. Now, while the world celebrates liberty and freedom by erecting statutes and observing public holidays, we in the Church of God celebrate true liberty and freedom by observing the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement represents the time when the whole world will experience true liberty and freedom. And that's the title of my sermon today. True Liberty and Freedom. Brethren, today by observing the Day of Atonement, we look forward to the time when the world will be liberated from spiritual bondage to Satan and his demons. Presently, all mankind is enslaved to sin and is in desperate need of true liberty and freedom. The whole world has been held captive by Satan 
and is in desperate need of a liberator. And it has been held captive since the Garden of Eden. From the time when Adam and Eve believed Satan's lie and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As a result of that one act, Adam and Eve and all their offspring after them, including us, were spiritually kidnapped by Satan and have been held captive by him ever since. Now the only person that can save the world and free it from spiritual bondage is Jesus Christ. He is our liberator, our emancipator, our savior, our redeemer. He is the only one that can pay the ransom that needs to be paid to secure our release from captivity from bondage to sin and its deadly consequences. And this is why God sent him to earth uh, almost 2,000 years ago. This was his purpose and mission. And let's go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 where Jesus himself describes his mission, his purpose for coming. Luke chapter 4, and let's begin in verse uh, 16. Luke 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the, the acceptable year of the Lord. Brethren, notice that in these verses, Jesus uses the words liberty twice in these verses. Jesus came to liberate the, world, the whole world from captivity and oppression, from spiritual bondage and slavery to Satan and sin. Jesus became our Redeemer back in AD 31 when he shed his precious blood on the cross for you and for me. His shed blood paid the penalty for our sins and freed us from spiritual bondage to Satan and sin. And not only for us in the Church of God, but for the whole world. So that all mankind could eventually be saved from the penalty of sin, which is eternal death. Now Jesus started the liberation process when he first came to earth. And when he comes the second time, he will complete the process. The Day of Atonement pictures the time when a major step of the liberation process is completed. True liberty and freedom will only become a reality when Satan is cast into the bottomless pit. And let's look at when that will happen. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20. And let's begin in verse 1. Verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. 
He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. Now brethren, as we read these verses, a question can be asked. Is Satan the strongest angel that God ever created? Any answers to that question? Well, these verses give the answer. And the answer is no. Because to bind Satan and cast him into the bottom into the bottomless pit by himself, this angel here must be stronger than Satan. So these verses definitely show that there is at least one angel stronger than Satan. Another thought that comes to mind. Satan was so good at deceiving the nations of the earth and all mankind that he even deceived himself. He deceived himself into believing that he could overthrow God, that he was stronger than God. And as we know in Isaiah chapter 14, he said, I will be like the Most High. Now, Satan deceiving himself is a reminder of what can happen to us, where we can deceive ourselves also. Because, brethren, the human mind influenced by Satan is susceptible to self-deception. And the Apostle James describes one of the ways we can deceive ourselves. And let's go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And let's remind ourselves of what the Apostle James says. Verse 22 of James chapter 1. Verse 22. Be, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Brethren, by not doing what we learn, we deceive ourselves. And we have the reminder in Jeremiah 17 verse 9, which says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and that is because our hearts are influenced by Satan and just like how Satan <coughs> deceived himself we must be careful we don't deceive ourselves now the verses we just read in Revelation chapter 20 pictures the day when all deception perpetrated by Satan will end. The world will no longer be subject to all the temptations, lies, and deceits that Satan propagates to keep mankind in spiritual captivity. The world will experience a spiritual liberty and freedom that they never had before. Brethren, this, um, this event here in Revelation 20 that we just read will usher in a period of 1,000 years when the world will be free of the deceptions and influence of Satan and his demons. And this is when true liberty and freedom will begin on the earth. And this will be when the world will become full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. <coughs> the world will no longer...
longer be full of the knowledge of Satan and his ways as it is now. And I'm sure during the Feast of Tabernacles, which we'll be observing in a few days' time, much more will be said about that. Now, another question one can ask is, why doesn't God bind Satan now? Why is he allowing Satan to continue to control this world and wreak so much havoc? Well, Virgin, the answer to that is simple. God has established a plan of salvation, and that plan has a time frame in which Satan must be allowed to exert his negative influence on mankind. God is allowing Satan now to rule this world and to live contrary to God's laws, God's laws. To allow mankind to prove once and for all that Satan's way does not work. It does not produce lasting peace, prosperity, and happiness. God wants mankind to prove for himself that the way of get way of deciding for himself what is right and what is wrong, which is symbolized by the tree of knowledge of good and evil, will eventually lead to death and the ultimate destruction of this world. Now, as we look around, we see this is already happening around us. Mankind is slowly destroying this planet on which, we leave, on which we live. We are destroying the plants, the trees, the animals that inhabit this earth. And we are also destroying the earth's climate. Mankind is in a desperate race to try and slow down the destruction of the climate and the environment. We see the United Nations convening conferences with all the nations of the world to try and prevent climate change. We may be familiar with the Paris Agreement, the New York conference that was recently held and similar conferences where nations make commitments to reduce carbon emissions. But the problem is that these agreements or commitments are not binding. There are no consequences if the commitments are not kept. Brethren, we know that ultimately all man's efforts will fail. They will fail because man has rejected God's ways and his laws. And a point will be reached in the near future where if God does not intervene in the fears of this world, no flesh would be saved alive. And let's go to Matthew chapter 24, which refers to that. Matthew 24, and let's look at verse 22. Matthew 24 and verse 22. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. But there's another reason why God does not bind Satan now is because he wants us to become overcomers. He wants each one of us to overcome Satan. And brethren, for us to qualify to rule this world as kings and priests under Jesus Christ, we must overcome Satan just like how Jesus overcame Satan when he came the first time. God sent Jesus Christ as a human being to this earth to show that it is possible 
for human being to overcome Satan with the help of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus overcame Satan by resisting all the temptations that Satan could throw at him. And let's go to Matthew chapter 4, where that is described. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Verse 1 of Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So we see here, brethren, that Satan is the great tempter. He tempts with things that appear good on the surface, but which will eventually lead to death. Satan, however, can only tempt. He cannot force us to do anything. If we do something, it is because we choose to do it. And some of us may be familiar with the old saying, the devil made me do it. Well, we know that is false. The devil cannot make us do anything. So therefore, we have to accept responsibility for all the actions we perform. The devil may put thoughts into our minds, but then we have to decide if we want to entertain the thought or if we want to reject it. And this is why, brethren, the battle is ultimately in our minds. It is a spiritual battle that is ultimately won or lost in the mind. And let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And let's look at verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk according to the flesh. For the weapons of all warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Brethren, we are in a constant but daily spiritual battle with Satan to control our minds. Now, thankfully, Jesus won that spiritual battle with Satan, where he resisted all the temptations that Satan could throw at him. And he paved the way for us to be able to overcome the temptations of Satan. Jesus overcame Satan at the beginning of his ministry and he continued to overcome him right up to his death on the cross. And then the very night before he was crucified, he makes a statement about overcoming. And let's go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, and look at what he said. John 16, verse 33. Verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But when Jesus overcame the world and all the temptations that, G that Satan threw at him, and we can also. And this is why he tells his disciples and also us who are living at this end time to be of good cheer. Because he knew that once we allow him to live in us, 
we can be overcomers as well. Now the question can be asked, why do we fast on the Day of Atonement? and also at other times during the year. Well, brethren, to overcome Satan requires we be close to God. And to get close to God requires fasting. And this is why Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights before he faced Satan. And let's read that in Matthew chapter 4. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 4 and let's look at verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Brethren, fasting brings us closer to God and strengthens us spiritually. Whilst we may be weak, Physically, because of fasting, we become stronger spiritually. And then we are better able to resist Satan and his temptations and overcome him. And let's go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4 and let's look at verse 7. which looks at how we can draw closer to God. James 4 verse 7 Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Brethren, when we fast, we draw near to God, and God in turn draws near to us. And it is then easier to submit to God and His will in our lives. And as we submit and yield to God, it is easier to submit to, sorry, to resist and overcome the temptations of Satan. Now another benefit of fasting is that it helps us to recognize how weak and feeble we truly are and how much we need God in our lives. It helps us to grow in humility and meekness, which are the antidotes to pride and vanity. And let's look at James, let's go back to verse 6 of James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Brethren, God resists and hates proud people, but he loves humble people. Now the question we can ask is, which are we? Are we growing in humility? Or are we still full of pride? Brethren, the more humble and meek we are, the easier it is to resist and overcome Satan. Brethren, we have been called to be overcomers. Overcomers of Satan overcomers of our selfish human nature and overcomers of the things of the world. And this is why God promises a blessing to every saint that overcomes, no matter what era of the church they were in. In Revelation 2 and 3, all seven eras of the church of God are promised a blessing for overcoming. Let's just take a quick look at that. Revelation, let's go to Revelation 2. Revelation 2. And let's look at verse 7. Verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, 
I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And when God talks about overcoming, he who overcomes, he referring to those who overcome Satan. Let's drop down to verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And this was to the church at Smyrna. The one we just read in verse 7 was to the church at Ephesus. Let's look at the church at Pergamos. Verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name, written which no one knows except him who receives it. Let's look at Tyra Tyra, verse 26 of Revelation 2. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. To the church at Sardis, let's go over to Revelation 3 verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. To the church at Philadelphia, Revelation 3 verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. And finally to the seventh church at Laodicea. Let's look at verse 21 of Revelation 3. To him who overcomes I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Brethren, Jesus overcame Satan and he expects us to overcome him as well. And these verses illustrate how important overcoming is to Jesus. Every message to these seven churches includes a reference to overcoming. And brethren, the message from Jesus is clear. Only overcomers will be in the kingdom of God. And this is one of the reasons why Satan is still around. Why God has not bound him up already. Because God wants us to overcome him. So brethren, let us not underestimate the importance of overcoming. Brethren, the Day of Atonement pictures the day when Satan will finally be overcome and restrained. He will no longer be able to influence and control mankind as he has done for the past 6,000 plus years. The world will finally be able to experience true liberty and freedom like it has never done before. Now, what are some of the freedoms that the world will experience when the Day of Atonement is fulfilled? Well, I just want to look at a few of them. And the first one that we will look at is freedom from sin. Brethren, with Satan gone, everyone will start to obey God's laws and commandments. And since sin is the transgression of God's laws, mankind, as he starts to obey God's laws, will experience a drastic reduction in sin and will experience the corresponding blessings and rewards of obedience to God's laws. 
Now, Satan was the first being to sin. And in Ezekiel 28, it says that Satan was perfect in all his ways until iniquity was found in him. And as the source and beginner of all sin, Satan bears responsibility for the sins of the world. And on the Day of Atonement, in the Old Testament, a special ceremony was performed where the high priest had to select two goats. And we heard about that in the sermonette. And let's quickly go to Leviticus 16, where I just want to review part of that, of what occurred there. Leviticus 16, with the scapegoat, or what was called the Azazel. As we heard, there were two goats. The first goat represented Jesus Christ and was killed. This represented Jesus Christ dying for the sins of the world. Now let's look at what happens with the second goat. And Leviticus, Levit Leviticus 16 verse 20. Verse 20. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Brethren, all the sins of the people were placed on this second goat, and it was led into the wilderness by a suitable man. And brethren, this ceremony <coughs> pictured here, Pictures what will occur in Revelation 20 when the sins of the world are placed on Satan and he is cast into the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. Only when this occurs will the world experience freedom from sin. A second freedom that the world will experience is freedom from lies and deceit. In John 8 verse 44, Jesus describes Satan as the father of all lies. And in Revelation 12 verse 9, Satan is described as deceiving the whole world. With Satan gone, the world will experience freedom from lies and deceit. There will be no more fake news and false witnesses which are so prevalent now. People will be taught to speak the truth at all times. A third freedom that we can look forward to is freedom from temptation. In Matthew chapter 4, where we read about Jesus being tempted by Satan, Satan is described as the tempter. Satan is the source of all temptation. He is described as the prince of the power of the air. And this is in Ephesians 2 verse 2. And he is constantly broadcasting temptations to the human spirit in all of us. We are all familiar with cell phones. We are all familiar with the internet information is constantly moving through the air around us just like how that influence that information moves through the air satan broadcasts his temptations to us 
Satan, when he tempts us, he tempts us in the hope that we will fail, that we will disobey God. And when he is removed, the minds of human beings will no longer be flooded with the evil thoughts and desires that, uh, that exist right now. People will instead focus on what is good and right and not what is evil and wrong. A fourth freedom that the world will experience is freedom from war. Satan is the originator of war. In John 8 verse 44, Jesus says that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. And war is just murder on a large scale. Satan started the first war, and this war occurred in heaven when he tried to overthrow God. And even though he lost that first war, he has continued to wage war here on earth. And I'm reminded of the song by Bob Marley called War, war where he says, Everywhere is war. I don't know if you all are familiar with that song. At this point, I just want to show a short video, which is a reminder of how war pervades our world at this time. China has showed off some of the most advanced weaponry in the world with a huge military grade in Beijing. In a full display of power for its rivals, they've unveiled a new range of high-tech military weapons for the very first time. One of those is this intercontinental ballistic missile. It can carry up to 10 nuclear warheads and can reach the United States in as little as 30 minutes. With a range of 9,000 miles, it can fly further than any other nuclear missile in the world. Overhead, a new strategic bomber designed to project power far into the Pacific Ocean and China's first stealth jet fighters. But the showstoppers were the weapons of the future. There was the Sharp Sword Combat Drone, an unmanned aerial combat vehicle that could make piloted strike fighters obsolete. This supersonic reconnaissance drone, designed to locate American aircraft carriers far out in the Pacific Ocean. And a hypersonic missile, a sleek dart that flies at more than five times the speed of sound, so fast it can penetrate all existing missile defenses used by the West. these are some of the weapons of the future and we know that at some point in time they will be used brethren when Satan is removed all war will cease because the Prince of Peace will now be ruling the earth and mankind will experience peace on earth like never before Brethren, these are just some of the freedoms that will occur after Satan is restrained from doing his evil deeds. And as true liberty and freedom pervades the world, the deep meaning of the Day of Atonement will become a reality. Man will finally be able to become one with God. And that is the aim of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For God and man to become one. And the night before he died, Jesus stressed his desire for God and man to become one. And for final scripture, let's go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And let's look. Let's begin at verse 20. Verse 20 of John 17. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their will, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me, 
I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are, we are one. Brethren, this at one meant can only be achieved if Satan is removed and prevented from separating man from God. And God has called us now to become one with him and Jesus Christ. And then eventually to assist them in helping all mankind to become one with them. So in conclusion, brethren, many battles have been fought to try and achieve physical liberty and freedom. But physical liberty and freedom can only be achieved if spiritual liberty and freedom is achieved first. And spiritual liberty and freedom can only be achieved if Satan is removed and not allowed to perform his evil works. And the Day of Atonement pictures this time when this will finally be achieved. When Satan is removed, True liberty and freedom will become a reality, and then mankind as a whole will be able to become one with God. May we all be present to witness the day when true liberty and freedom becomes a reality for all mankind.